A university lecturer who was wrongly accused of Islamophobia has revealed that he was scared for his life. Such was the hate campaign he was subjected to. Professor Stephen Greer was practically forced into hiding after Bristol University Law School undergraduates claimed that elements of a course he was teaching were racist and discriminatory. He was exonerated, however, by an inquiry of any wrongdoing and has now written a book, Falsely Accused of Islamophobia, My Struggle Against Academic Cancellation. This was published this week by Academica Press. And Professor Stephen Greer joins me now. Professor Greer, thanks very much for joining me today. Could we start by just going through what the welcome. accusations were against you? What exactly were these students claiming that you had done? Well... It's important to bear in mind the background to this. I had been teaching this unit and the module, the unit's called Human Rights and Law, Politics and Society. And the, the module is entitled Islam, China and the Far East. I've been teaching this for nearly a decade and a half, including two Muslim students without incident. Basically, the University of Bristol Islamic Society, Brissock, uh, claimed that practically everything in the mod, in fact, everything in the model, a module, was Islamophobic. Um, even things like uh, the, 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 they, they told several lies, for example. They said that um, I had claimed that the Chinese repression of the Uyghurs um, was only superficially uh, discriminatory. And what, in fact, they'd done there was they'd alighted to, that was exactly the opposite of what I've said, they'd alighted a claim I made about the counterterrorism in this country, which I said was only superficially discriminatory, with a claim I'd said about the Chinese, which I said it was much more obviously, they were much more obviously a suspect community or a securitized community out there. So there were several other things, but but they even claim, for example, that, that things that are universally acknowledged and accepted in the academic literature, for example, that in, in its early history, Islam spread through war, conquest, and later trade and conversion. Um, they claimed that was Islamophobic, uh, and in fact, a lot of a lot of things, everything that I said in in the course was uh, based upon uh, the authoritative academic sources, and they claimed that it was all Islamophobic. I mean, this is very difficult to comprehend in many ways because um, it reminds me of the cross-party uh, in, in inquiry into Islamophobia that we had. And the government came up with this idea that if you were to mention that the Prophet Muhammad had uh, wives who we would consider to be underage, that that would be Islamophobic and anyone who suggested it was. But of course, that's, that's in the Islamic text. So they're not really doing their research. But also, weren't you accused of laughing at the Quran and that kind of thing? Yes, I mean, that was another lie. What we didn't, the, the class la actually laughed at an extract from the Analects of Confucius, which I had uh, quoted in the same class as I'd, I'd quoted from the Quran. So the people who accused me of laughing at the Quran were either not paying particularly close attention or it was a, another deliberate lie. But there were so many deliberate lies in the accusation that it's difficult to give it any credit. And I think we ought to appreciate that the the motive for this uh, smear and this the, this vilification and victimization um, was to try and discredit my uh, defense of the Prevent Counter Terrorist Program and also to rescue another Bristol professor, David Miller, who was accused of anti-Semitism and who was eventually sacked from um, the the the, the the trouble that he found himself in. Can I ask you about the accusation? Because an accusation of Islamophobia can be very dangerous in of itself. I mean, if you look at the precedent of what happened to Samuel Paty, the teacher in Paris who was uh, attacked and killed. Similarly, of course, uh, the, the massacre at Charlie Hebdo. You know, this is not a, an accusation that should be made lightly. Uh, what has been your experience of this? Well, when I first discovered it, the, the, the complaint was made to the University of Bristol in October 2020, and they sat on it uh, for several months. I didn't even get, I, I heard there was, there had been a complaint, but I wasn't told what it precisely was. I didn't find out what the complaint was until Brissot launched this scurrilous and very, very uh, hostile social media campaign on the 15th of November 2021. Um, and of course, like you say, even just being accused of Islamophobia and having laughed at the Quran, all of these things are uh, potentially life-threatening. 
So it was very, very frightening. And I appealed to the university immediately on, on the day itself that they must do something to stop it. And they haven't done anything to stop it, on, even up until this, uh, even up until today. Now, the campaign has retreated into the shadows, but a lot of the material, the um, uh, defamatory material, for example, the petition, is still readily available on um, the, the internet. So one of your previous guests was talking about cowardice, and I think that's exactly what happened in my case. The university could have and should have disciplined these students, but declined to do so because it was afraid of itself being condemned as Islamophobic. I mean, is there a broader problem here with this idea that one particular religion ought to be ring-fenced ring from criticism? Now, you've made clear that you weren't uh, being Islamophobic, but what about people who do want to mock Islam? Should that not be within our rights to do that as well? We mock uh, Christianity, Judaism, whatever. Well, um, I'm only going to comment upon the academic context. I think in the academic context, which is the one that most applies to me, um, everything I'd said was measured careful, cautious, supported by the academic literature. And because it was that, I felt absolutely secure and safe and that there was nothing that could possibly be legitimately condemned about it, how wrong I was. And what sort of precautions did you find yourself taking once, once the accusations came in? Well, the, the, the immediate, immediate, in the immediate aftermath of it, nothing really. But uh, there was a, a suspicious incident outside my home on the 25th of February 2021, the day the, that Al Jazeera reported the story. And uh, my wife, this was during COVID, of course, my wife happened to be, had made an arrangement to travel to a young friend who just had a baby and whose husband was abroad um, the next day. And I decided I was going to go with her even though that would have otherwise have been a breach of COVID uh, restrictions. We, we, we um, contacted the police. The police took the incident very, very seriously. And of course, they didn't regard the fact that I joined her for a few days as uh, a violation of the COVID regulations. It was an emergency. What I did thereafter was when we returned to Bristol, I um, wore a disguise. At the time, I used to wear contact lenses, so I had a fair pair of fake glasses. I pulled the hood of my um, hoodie up. I started to grow a beard, but it took a few weeks for that to actually to get to any significant length. I carried a stout umbrella. I carried a little screwdriver in my pocket. So it was a worrying time, but over, over a couple of weeks, of course, the sense of anxiety diminished. And uh, I also I also thought of uh, leaving Bristol uh, and and going to stay with my brother and his sister, my sister in law, who live in Northern Ireland. But I thought this is this is cowardly on my part. Um, if these people are coming after me and if they want to make me a martyr to freedom of expression and academic freedom, so be it. I've had a good life. I'm in my mid sixties now. I want to carry on having a good life. But if somebody wants to do me harm for this for this reason, so be it. Do you feel now that you've been exonerated that, that things can go back to some level of normalcy? Well, no. Um, I, I've retired now. And the reason that I chose to write the book and to take the stand that I have is because that, that was on the agenda, that, that was, you know, planned. Um, had I been a younger man uh, earlier in my career, uh, I may well have taken a very different course of action. But um, in, in the last few months of my working life, the university uh, failed even to officially um, um, recognize or, or to, to validate my return to work. I was off work. For, th for several months, as as you, as on a kind of the stress of this uh, uh, crisis from September twenty one to January twenty two, the university failed officially to to um, authorize my return to work. So I retired in September twenty twenty two under a cloud and hugely demoralized and disappointed that uh, after thirty six years of service, this was the reward that I had received.